Hi, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, home of the London Bridge. Today, our message is about joy. Again this week, we'll be focusing on Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Life Notes are available now from our website, calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 is our text. If you are in the room and you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab a Bible around you. They're in the seats all around you. Turn to page 1,158, 1158, and you'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then just message the service host or email us at calvaryaz.com. We will get you a Bible, whether we mail it to you or hand deliver it to you, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, so, hey, who wants more joy in their life? All right. If you didn't answer, um, do you have too much joy? I mean, does anybody have too much joy in their life? Like, you're like, I really need something to depress me and bring me down. <laughs> you know, it's like things are too good. Uh, so I, I just, I need a little less goodness in my life. No, I, I mean, you know, we all pursue happiness, fun, and joy. It, it's like our American birthright, right? Because Thomas Jefferson, writing the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, penned these words. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and... You guys have heard this. Good. The pursuit of happiness. And we as Americans take this pursuit seriously. Now, predating our Declaration of Independence by about 1,700 years, the Apostle Paul declared that joy is part of our birthright as followers of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, that he really is worthy, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal, you believe he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I want you to understand that God the Holy Spirit is in you, and he is calling you and teaching us how to live a life of joy. And as we continue our study in the fruit of the Spirit, today we're talking about joy and why it's important and what gets in our way and how we can live joyfully. Because, you know, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, you guys are supposed to be memorizing this, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, he doesn't stop there. I mean, Paul mentions that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, one we're talking about. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, he says, rejoice always. In Philippians 4, 4, he says, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. I mean, three times he makes these, these adamant statements about joy. And what Paul is telling us is that joy is essential. Joy is essential. It's not really an option for followers of Jesus. Now, it may be optional in your life. It, it sometimes can be optional in our lives. But for those of us who are, who are followers who believe in Jesus, this is part of God's plan for us to have joy. Now, I grew up in biblical churches. They taught the truth of God. But can I just tell you, they didn't emphasize joy. I mean, they, they really didn't. I mean, they, they taught the fruit of the Spirit. And, and they taught me to love Scripture. And they taught me to read the Bible. And they, and they introduced me to Jesus. And those are wonderful gifts that they gave me. Uh, but, uh, but they leaned a whole lot more heavily into being sober-minded, vigilant, reverent. Anybody with me on that? Do you have lots of lessons on reverent? I mean, as teenagers, we were never reverent. Right? It's, it's kind of hard to be reverent as teenagers because you're allowed kids. You know, kids, are all, we're always lectured about, you know, being reverent. I can just tell you, we had, you know, Vacation Bible School Week, you know, Kids Week this last week here, and this place uh, was joyful. 
Uh, and I think it was reverent, but it was loud, and it was wild, and it was fun, and, uh, and praise God for that. 130 kids hearing about Jesus, worshiping Jesus, celebrating that, uh, and, uh, and if you're not comfortable with kids like, having to run to the church, then glad you didn't make it. But anyway, you know, but there's a lot of churches that struggle teaching this stuff. When I came to Calvary, I, I can tell you this story. So, you know, 32 years ago, uh, and, and early on, uh, like the first year and a half I was here, it was time for my annual personnel committee review. And so I sat down with people and I was expecting a good review. I'll tell you, like church had grown by about 50%. You know, we were in the black for like the first time in forever uh, financially. We were baptizing more people than ever before. So I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be a good review. I got a really lousy review. <laughs> and you know why? This is, you know what they marked me down for? I wasn't serious enough in business meetings. <laughs> and I, I'll just confess, I wasn't, okay? so. And I said, that's why people come to business meetings, because we're not taking ourselves too seriously. By the way, I think the world takes itself about two notches too seriously. Most of us do too. But you know, being sober-minded, being vigilant, <laughs> these are commands in scripture, okay? So you know, the Bible admonishes us to be sober-minded, to be vigilant about 20 times in God's word. It's important. But the Bible tells us to rejoice, be joyful, or have joy. Oh wait, let's play a little game here. You tell the person next to you how many times you think the Bible tells us to rejoice, be joyful, or have joy, okay? So take, give them a number. Go ahead, take, take a few seconds. You don't get much time. You don't get to agonize over this. You just gotta like, give them a number. Okay, turn around, look for somebody who doesn't, you're, if you guys really wanna make it interesting, loser buys dinner, okay? So uh, you got your number? Okay, about 400 times. Anybody get it? Okay, exactly, you got it. Okay, exactly in the ESV, 420 times. So this version of the Bible, 420 times, it tells us to be joyful or have joy or to rejoice. Now, obviously, both are important, but which one is essential? Joy. You guys are like, I don't know. 420 versus 20. I don't know which one's more important. I mean, they're both important, but which, which one is a fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you guys are listening. So, so look, I, I, I want you to be vigilant, but I want you to be joyful. It's a both and. But joy is essential, and it's essential to be like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit represents the character of Christ. I mean, that's why Paul put it in there. He goes, hey, you want to look like Jesus? That's what he's talking about. And, and he's going, the deeds of the flesh, and here's the fruit of the Spirit. And, and so I want you to be like Jesus. And we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And that's true of joy. In John 15, right before Jesus was arrested and trial, put on trial and crucified, he said this to his disciples. He said, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Now think about that. Jesus is talking to his disciples. We're his disciples, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, you're his disciple. And, and he says, look, uh, I've told you all these truths so that my joy will be in you. So Jesus had joy. I want you to understand, that's him telling, I've got joy. I want my joy in you and I want your joy to be like capacity. I want you to be full of joy. That, I think that's cool. So we are called to be a people of joy. And here at Calvary, we take joy seriously. Oh, come on. Didn't you guys appreciate that oxymoron? <laughs> I mean, I, I like, that's my favorite line in the whole sermon. So if you guys, <laughs> nobody really cares. Uh, look, we take joy seriously because we want you to be like your Savior. And joy is essential. So joy is essential to be like Jesus. And joy is essential to the mission. Look, here at Calvary, one of our core values is contagious celebration. You see, we believe that following Jesus results in a joy-filled life which draws people to Jesus. Okay? Following Jesus results in a joy-filled life which draws other people to Jesus. I mean, it's a natural thing. I, I mean, I've, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but our world is still in this pursuit of happiness, and what they're really looking for is the joy of Jesus. Yeah. That, that's what they want. And so if we are actually living out the joy of Jesus in our lives, it's going to draw people to Jesus. Uh, by the way, this is why I think uh, the church I grew up in, you know, the churches I grew up in, because I moved a lot, were not really effective at reaching people because they didn't do joy very well. And I think that was the missing ingredient. 
Because if, let's just be honest about this. If you are joy challenged and you invite people to church, they tend to say no. Because they assume it's a fun, uh, full of joyless, fun-sucking people and who wants that? <laughs> you guys ever been around a bunch of Christians who are joyless, fun-sucking people? Because I, I have. I mean, that's why I got in trouble in church all the time. But what happens if you are a joy-filled follower of Jesus and you invite people to church? It's much more likely that they're going to say yes. You know why? Because everybody wants more joy, just like you guys. And if they see joy in your life, then they're going to go, hey, you know, maybe I'll check that out. Maybe I could go and hang out with them because they're not, you know, a bunch of curmudgeons who, who don't approve of anything and they smile sometimes. So I just want you to know that Calvary is committed to being a place of joyful celebration. We're going to celebrate life change. We're going to celebrate the goodness of God, whether you like it or not. You guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay, good. You're here. So, hey, but the problem is things get in the way. Things get in the way of a joy-filled life. So we want the joy-filled life. God wants us to have a joy-filled life. We, we got to, you know, have that joy-filled life so we're like Jesus and so we can be effective on our mission. But stuff gets in the way. So let's talk about joy killers. Joy killers. Because they're real. I mean, if we're hurting and we have pain, we take painkillers. And, and the problem is we can get addicted to the painkillers. And, and the other problem in our lives is we kind of embrace joy killers uh, and, uh, and we kind of get stuck on them and they just lessen the joy in our lives until it's not there. So let's talk about joy killers. Now, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot that could be mentioned, but I just want to mention two joy killers that are kind of ever-present uh, in our day-to-day -day struggle, uh, and they're just obstacles that are sabotaging our ability to rejoice. So uh, I'm just going to share these. You kind of look at your own life and kind of assess where you're at. So the first joy killer I want to mention is anger. Anger is a joy killer. If you look back up in chapter 5, and, and we've done this before, but uh, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, things like these. Okay? Now, he just has a list of stuff. And did you notice that about half of that list is anger-related? It's anger-related. I mean, you've got uh, uh, all these different things, that strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, factions. I mean, it's all this conflict stuff. It's joy killers. See, the reality is we have conflict. And then when we have conflict, we get offended. And we get angry because we're offended. By the way, this is really popular these days. Have you noticed that? I mean, our culture is like ready to get angry. It's outrage culture. Like, oh, look what they did. Let's cancel them. Let's, you know, attack. Let's go. That, that's the world we live in. And, and what happens is we justify our anger. Well, I'm right, so I have a right to be angry. It's their fault if they hadn't done that. They owe me an apology. And then we hold on to our anger and we hold on to our bitterness. So rage and revenge start growing inside of our hearts. And by the way, anger, unforgiveness, and bitterness is the death spiral of joy. Let me say that again. Anger, unforgiveness, and bitterness is the death spiral of joy. Because you can't be joyful and angry at the same time. Just, it's impossible. You can't be joyful and bitter at the same time. You're going to be one or the other. It's not, it's not possible to do both simultaneously. Now, some people, you know, and I, I grew up in church, so especially church people, I, I've seen them do this. They try to do the fake joy thing. You know, when they were, they're really angry and bitter and all that kind of stuff, and they do the fake thing and they plaster on the over, you know, expressive smile and, and kind of act like it. But, but honestly, it doesn't take that long for you to realize that it's fake and it's ugly and unattractive. So we're not talking about that kind of faking stuff. We're talking about the reality that, that you can't be joyful and angry at the same time. And many of us are living angry, offended lives, and we wonder why we don't have joy. So anger is a joy killer. And I'm just going to tell you that entitlement is a joy killer as well. You see, when we think that we deserve better, then we're entitled. And it's often because we have bought into the American delusion of entitlement. 
You know what I'm talking about. We, we see it all around us. Sometimes we live it. People start going, well, you owe me respect. I deserve to be treated better. You have no right to speak to me that way. Do you know who I am? You ever have someone tell you that? Do you know who I am? Um, it's like, no, but God does. And <laughs> but see, here's the thing. I, can I just remind us that biblically, all of us deserve hell. judgment and hell. That's it, right? Judgment and hell. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the wages of sin is death. What you deserve, what you have earned is death. I mean, that's reality. Can I just remind you too that we reap what we sow. There, there, there isn't any like uh, special entitlement for, you know, your actions. You get what you put into life. It comes back to you. That's the word of God. And, and besides, it, this is the part that kills me. Because we are an entitled culture. But if you are living today, like right now, everybody in this room, everybody joining us online, if you're living today in the United States of America, you won the lottery of history. Okay, I mean, you, number one, you didn't choose when to be born. You didn't choose who your parents were. You didn't choose where you were born. You just showed up into the most prosperous, peaceful, free, and healthy nation in the history of the world. And then, yeah, you guys can celebrate that. We didn't have anything to do with it. We just showed up and got it. <laughs> See, and, and we're, we're, we're extremely blessed because of that. It, you know, I, I know there's people who feel guilty about that. I don't feel guilty. I'm just like, thank you, God. But, but here's the thing. We, it's way better than we deserve. It's way better than 90% of the world gets. And yet we still live out this entitlement, like, oh, we're owed something or we deserve better than what we have. And yet we're, we're so good. So, so by, we won the lottery of history. Stop complaining. Stop griping. And remember, you don't want what you deserve. Well, you might, I don't. I don't want what I deserve. God has blessed us abundantly more than any of us deserve. So, by the way, you cannot be entitled and joyful at the same time. Because usually when you're entitled, you're complaining about something that you didn't get that you thought you deserved, and that doesn't work with joy. You're either going to be joyful or you're going to be entitled. So uh, joy makes you aware of your sinfulness and your rebellion, aware that without the mercy of Jesus, we all end up in hell, and then aware of that, lives a life out of gratitude for the grace of God. That, that's, that's the fuel of joy. So if you want more joy, then repent of your entitled attitude. If you want more joy, then deal with your anger, because joy is essential. And, and we've already established we want more joy. So how do we get more joy in our lives? Glad you asked. Because to rejoice is a choice. Okay, to rejoice is a choice. And yes, it rhymes so that you'll remember it, okay? You can decide. You can, you can you know, encourage each other with that. Uh, let me just remind you that joy is not a feeling. In fact, none of the fruit of the Spirit are feelings because God doesn't command us to feel. God commands us to act. He commands us to obey. And you might go, well, I, I want joy is a feeling. No, happiness is a feeling, and it comes and goes, depending on circumstances, depending on moods, all that kind of stuff. To rejoice is a choice. You can choose joy. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. It's a command. He doesn't say, I want you to feel good. He says, I want you to rejoice. Always, period. So the first reason that we can rejoice always is because of the truth that we believe. You can choose to rejoice because God loves you. Right? You know God loves you, right? For God so loves the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God sent Jesus into this world to, to die for you so that you could be his. So you can rejoice because God loves you. You can rejoice because God has forgiven you through the sacrifice of Jesus. Okay, you can rejoice because God is with you. He put his Holy Spirit in you when you confess Jesus as Lord. And you can rejoice because God has promised you heaven when you deserve hell. Now, I just gave you four reasons that you can rejoice always. And, and here's the thing. I'm just gonna challenge you to remember these and, and actually let them become a part of your prayer life, your gratitude every morning when you wake up. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being with me. And thank you for promising me heaven. 
right there. Th those four things is a reason you can rejoice always because they're true always. Doesn't matter if you feel good or if you feel bad. Doesn't matter if life is good or if life is a struggle. It doesn't matter if everything is going your way and coming up roses or if everything is like you're living in a trash dump, okay? You can still rejoice always because God loves you. God has saved you. God is with you. And, you know, and the best is yet to come because heaven is what's ahead of us. I mean, that, I, I'm just being honest. Any four of those is reason to rejoice always. All four of them together is a slam dunk. So, right, I mean, it's just, it, and, and this is true for us. So when we wake up in the morning, why don't you just remind yourself of those truths? Just say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being with me today, whatever we face. And thank you that no matter what happens, heaven is ahead of me. You guys excited about heaven at all? Yeah. Okay, well, you guys are just like, all right, yeah, heaven golf clap, heaven, yeah. Um, you see, if you remind yourself of these realities, it is a game changer. Because when we rejoice in the truth, it gets in our lives and we start changing our attitude. So first of all, rejoice in the truth. And then if you want to have joy, if you're going to choose joy, then choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. Not just once, but continually. Choose to forgive. See, this is deciding to let go of anger and bitterness through forgiveness. Okay, I already told you, you can't rejoice and be angry at the same time. So you're either gonna be angry or you're gonna choose to forgive. And if you want joy in your life, then you're gonna choose to be obedient to Jesus and forgive. And, and that means you have to commit to the obedience of forgiveness. So forgive whomever you're angry at. Forgive the spouse who betrayed you. Forgive the parent who abused you. Forgive the boss who fired you. Forgive the friend who turned on you. Forgive God for allowing bad things to happen to you. Yes, some of you are angry at God. You need to forgive him. He didn't do anything wrong, but you need to forgive him. Forgive yourself for falling and failing and not being perfect. Forgive. And if you don't know how to forgive, let me just give you some steps, okay? Practically. The first one is you gotta, you gotta pray. Okay, you, you actually have to pray. You, you need to say, God, I want to forgive them. I don't feel like forgiving them because you don't feel like forgiving them because you feel angry, right? Because they, they hurt you. You go, I, I want to be obedient to you, God, so I need to forgive them. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So if we're going to do this, we're, we're doing it because we're kids of, of God. We're children of God. We believe in Jesus. So we're like, okay, I'm going to forgive. So uh, uh, whoever has offended you, you need to pray for them. You need to pray that God would bless them. You need to pray that God would reveal himself to them, that he'd fill their lives with love and heal them. And you go, well, I don't feel like that. I know. It's perfectly fine that you don't feel like that. You're not doing it because you feel like it. Why are you doing it? That's right, you're doing it to obey. And because you want joy in your life. And so you say, okay, I don't feel like this. I'm gonna pray this. I'm, you don't even have to mean it at the beginning. Okay. You are just simply going, all right, I'm obedient, God. You know, I don't really mean this, but I don't feel this, but here's what you told me to do. And you pray that every single day until one day you're praying it and you actually mean it. And you're praying it and you're like, oh, I'm not angry. My hands aren't clenched when I say their name anymore. And, you, and, and you're free of that anger and that bitterness and that rage that's inside of you and, and joy will come in. So you gotta keep doing that. It's, it's not a one-time thing. It's, a, it's an over and over. It's a disciplined prayer of forgiveness. God, I, I wanna forgive them and I want you to bless them and I want you to reveal yourself to them. I want you to fill their lives with your love because what you're praying for them is gonna happen to you. It's gonna bless you. And then if you're still struggling, look, get counseling, hopefully from a counselor who shares your faith and can it help you to work through some of that? Or, or maybe you just need to show up, you know, Monday nights at the Sweetwater Campus at 6.30 for Celebrate Recovery. And, and, and work the 12 steps because they will help you to get to that point where you can be set free and you can release that anger and you can make amends and all those things that need to happen to get you to freedom. But if you want to rejoice, if you want more joy in your life, then you have to forgive Choosing to rejoice is choosing to forgive. So choosing joy means for, you know, choosing to understand the truth about what God has done for you. It means choosing to forgive. And then I think if you want joy, then you gotta choose to practice preemptive grace. I've shared this before. I love this idea. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you, uh, that means that you decide not to be 
offended. Okay, you decide to forgive before people offend you. You're like, can I do that? Yes, you can. You can decide to forgive before people offend you. That's why I call it preemptive. It's before they do it. You know, you wake up in the morning and you say, God, I'm going to forgive my spouse because they're going to make me mad today. <laughs> and I want to forgive them before they do it. And so that when they do it and, and they do something to offend you, you're like, I've already forgiven you. It's all good. And you're not angry. You go, that's ridiculous. No, it's real. It's what we're told to do. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you, which means completely. And, and, and now, this is thinking countercultural. This is thinking biblically instead of like our culture. Because as we said before, our culture is an outrage culture that everybody's angry all the time at everyone. And they're looking for a reason to be offended. And I want you to be a rebel for grace. See, that's what it means to be a Jesus follower is let's be a rebel for grace. You know, just saying, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and, and represent Jesus in a really different way. Because people are looking to be offended. You maybe have some friends that are always looking to be offended. They're always mad at somebody. And I just challenge you to, to do the opposite. Be difficult to offend. It, by the way, it doesn't mean you're clueless. It just means you're abundantly graceful. So what does this look like? Because some of you are like, I like the idea, but how does it really play out? So let me just tell you what preemptive grace looks like. It means giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Your family, your, your spouse, your kids, even your in-laws. After all, you don't know what their motives were and you don't know what they meant by that. Now, I know you think you do, but you don't. Jesus knows, but you don't. So just decide, hey, you know what? I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. They didn't mean it that way. And, you know, preemptive grace means interpreting every conversation, every text, every email in the most positive way possible instead of reading offense into everything. Okay, some of you know who you are. You get a text and you get mad because you look at these words that are black and white and, and, uh, and, and you read into them offense. And, and, and I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I've had somebody go, I can't believe they said that. And I go, what? And they, and they go, here, look at what they wrote. And I go, looks pretty innocuous to me. And they're like, no. And I'm like, yeah, it does. It's neutral. Words are, you know, those words are neutral. And we choose to read into them offense. So just read them in the most positive way possible. You can do it. That's preemptive grace. And then, you know, preemptive grace means deciding that everything isn't personal. If you take everything personal, that's pride. Let me say that again. If you take everything personal, that's pride. And you know that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble? Okay? I'm just, I'm just telling you. If, so don't take it personally. When they cut you off in traffic, don't take it personal. They're just trying to get someplace. That's for me. Because um, <laughs> it's not personal. I just drive faster than you. Hey, when the server is slow to your table, don't take it personal. When, when they forgot to invite you to the party or the dinner or the celebration or the wedding, <laughs> be thankful. I mean, uh, <laughs> just, it's not personal. And even if it is personal, so what? You didn't want to go anyway, right? right. And, and, and so some of you are like, oh, I can't believe they left me off. And you're like, you don't even want to go. Why are you upset? Like, consider it a blessing from God. He just blessed you, and, uh, and we, still get, we still get all that. So it's not personal. And even if you know it's personal, just give them the benefit of the doubt. It's okay. You see, deciding to have preemptive grace is like putting on a suit of mercy over your life. And, and in my mind, I just, have you ever seen those sumo suits where you can put them on, you're all big, and you can like run in, bounce into people, and it doesn't hurt anyone? Just imagine that's your grace suit. People can bounce off of you, and you're like, that doesn't hurt. Why? Because it's, you've got mercy all over you. It's kind of like bubble wrapping your offense feelings so that they don't get offended. See, to do this, you have to return to that grace gratitude prayer, though. You got to go back to that truth. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for, you know, the, being with me. Thank you for heaven. You, you got to be grateful for your blessings. You know, blindness to your spiritual blessings is, is a, a spiritual disability. And by the way, if you can't see your blessings, then you're going to end up in that entitled place because you think you deserve more. And, and then, you know, if, you wanna, if you're going to practice preemptive grace, you've got to be a blessing to others. Which, by the way, you can't be a blessing if you're angry and entitled. 
But if you're gonna be a blessing, you can serve people, you can encourage people, you can be generous towards people. And, and, and look, I'm just gonna say this again, do this because we reap what we sow. And, and as you sow grace, if you practice preemptive grace, joy is gonna fill your life. Because you're not gonna be angry, and you're not gonna be upset, and you're not gonna be mad at everyone, and, and you're gonna go, hey, look at this, I got joy. And you're giving people grace, and when you give people grace, joy is gonna flood into your life. See, the Holy Spirit wants to teach us joy. Following Jesus results in a joy-filled life which draws people to Jesus. We can live angry and entitled or we can live with joy. I choose joy. I'm praying you do too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. We know that we're a mess. We know that we're not worthy and you are, but, but we thank you for the way that you have demonstrated grace to us. Thank you for the way that you have rescued us. Thank you for the way that you have healed us and redeemed our lives. And thank you that heaven has promised to us. God, we want to live those joy-filled lives. So right now we surrender to the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would teach us we ask that you would convict us. We ask that you'd point out the flaws in our life and we will give them over to you. We will repent and we will follow Jesus because we know that he wants to give us his joy and he wants our joy to be full. So Father, we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Chad laid out a few practical steps to help us experience joy. First, we must recognize that rejoicing is a choice. We can get there by choosing to forgive those who offend or have hurt us and proactively avoid being hurt by practicing preemptive grace. The Calvary Pastoral Team publishes daily devotional videos to encourage your walk with the Lord. To begin receiving them, you can sign up at calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and begin each morning with your word for the day. That's all for now. Please join us again next week when we will be speaking about peace. Have a great week. Bye-bye.